The year is 2002, and video games are going crazy. Less than two months ago, Halo Combat Evolved released, revolutionizing first-person shooters on consoles. The release of Elder Scrolls III, Morrowind, brought the RPG genre to new heights. All while, well, Metroid Prime showed the world the tight level design and exploration experience possible, only in this now mature era of 3D gaming. And these are just the most revolutionary genre of redefining video games on shelves this year. 2002 gave us Kingdom Hearts, GTA Vice City, The Wind Waker, Ratchet and Clank, Animal Crossing would see its first English release. Mario Sunshine, was actually a bit of a buggy step down from the last game. Cool looking water though. It is in this maelstrom of now classic and beloved game releases that one pair of brothers, Tarn and Zach Adams, took a look and decided, hmm, very interesting. Perhaps it is time for us to start working on a masterpiece of our own. The year is now 2006, and video games are going even crazier. The launch of the Wii is bringing gaming to new heights of popularity, proving the medium is no longer just a hobby for nerds in their mom's basement like me, but also for people who like to watch nerds in their mom's basement smash the television screen while pretending to bowl. After the runaway success of Halo 2's online play, online gaming has become a standard with Xbox Live and the brand new PlayStation Network. You can take out a home loan to pay for a PS3, and the Elder Scrolls Oblivion would soon invent the microtransaction. You know what? Maybe 2002 is better. But it is also here when Tarn and Zack's four years of labor would finally begin to bear fruit and unleash upon the world a landmark title, which creators of games such as RimWorld, Frostpunk, and even Minecraft would one day call an inspiration for their own games. Gamers and critics alike held their breath in anticipation, as on August 8th, 2006, Zack and Tarn released the first edition of what would become one of the greatest achievements in gaming history. What the fuck? Slaves to Armok, God of Blood, Chapter 2, Dwarf Fortress. What is Slaves to Armok, God of Blood, Chapter 1? Nobody knows, not even the developers. They've got to even add that part of the title to the Steam release. In the same year that this game came out. Can I be in your video, Devin? Um. The Adams Brothers released a game that looked like this. This music isn't even the game. That's Dig Dug. Just figuring out what you're looking at here can be a challenge. These little faces are dwarves. This squiggly line is grass. And this is supposed to be a cat. That's just the letter C. They didn't even try with this one. But once you finally take the time to figure out what you're looking at, it's still really hard to play. The controls are just as much of a nightmare to learn as the graphics. The game can only be navigated with the arrow keys and a series of hotkeys that bring up menus with the menus, few of which the game even tells you exist. You need to have a guide open next to you at all times just to know what buttons do what. Proper mouse controls with actual graphics wouldn't be added until the 2022 Steam release, which I'll be showcasing exclusively moving forward because, well, I've played this game for dozens of hours and I still don't know what I'm looking at here. But how is it a game with such an opaque interface and an unintuitive control scheme became one of the most influential games of the last 20 years. Once you pay $30 for a version of the game that doesn't require you to have a degree in Egyptian hieroglyphics to play, the game actually seems pretty straightforward. You make a fortress for dwarves. A dwarven fortification, if you will. Draw a place to dig, and a dwarf will dig. Draw a spot for a farm, and a dwarf will come to sow seeds. In Dwarf Fortress, you do not play as one particular dwarf doing any one particular thing, but instead you play as the collective societal consciousness of the fort, making decisions and plans that your dwarves will then work to carry out. And while this may sound like a real-time strategy game, these dwarves are not lifeless robots that simply exist to perform orders unquestionably, but instead individuals with unique personalities, needs, and desires. As such, these dwarves will only continue to participate in society as long as they feel their needs are sufficiently met. If you've ever played games like Frostpunk, Oxygen Not Included, and RimWorld, you may already be familiar with this style of colony sim gameplay. And while these games have built onto the colony sim genre with their own little twists and additions, still, all these years later, no other colony sim game has quite as many layers to it as Dwarf Fortress, both metaphorically and literally. For you see, the simple graphics of Dig Dug 2 here betray its true nature. Unlike RimWorld or other colony sims which play along a single 2D plane, Dwarf Fortress is a full 3D game comprised of hundreds of layers that your dwarves can move freely about. This opens up a whole new dimension of risks that you wouldn't need to think about in other games, such as besieging enemies that can climb or fly over walls. Or should you dig too deep, you may open yourself up to attack from the cave dwellers that live amongst 
produce the valuable minerals below. It is, however, with this added complexity and room for risk that new opportunities are open to the player as well. A few good bow dwarves can stand by and rain down arrows upon victims below. Entire rivers can be channeled, redirected, pumped up and down around your base for both defense and decoration. I like running waterfalls through my taverns. I love this thing. But the game's death is not limited to the x-axis. I haven't even talked about the dwarves themselves yet. Each dwarf has dozens of body parts the game tracks constantly, including 36 teeth, 20 fingers and toes, and dozens of other body parts. If a dwarf loses a finger, they'll have a chance to drop items to pick up. If they lose too many teeth, they'll no longer be able to bite. If a leg is damaged, they'll need a splint or crutch to walk. I even had a dwarf who had to be given artificial ribs following a particularly harsh battle. And this level of meticulous detail and complexity does not stop with their bodies, but extends into their minds as well. Each dwarf has a unique personality, goals, desires, thoughts, and feelings about the world around them. Dwarves will remember events they experience, forming both treasured memories and terrible traumas that will affect them moving forward in life. And this insane amount of detail isn't just flavor text either. This has actual gameplay ramifications. A dwarf suffering from depression may lose the will to do anything, ceasing all work and failing to act should they come into danger, while a dwarf whose needs aren't being met may lash out in violence and turn against the fortress they feel is spurned to them. And this same level of detail appears not only in the dwarves, but every animal monster, and even every surface of the game world. The floors and walls of your fortress can be engraved with the stories and depictions of real people who really existed in your randomly generated world, all being described using the unique dwarven script which consists of this dude's face over and over again. Dwarves can even read and take comfort or inspiration from these engravings as well, making these decorative little squiggles into an actual gameplay mechanic. Moving water can carry objects and sediment in its current, leaving mud, fish, and other debris wherever it flows. Ancient and powerful forgotten beasts roam the world, posing a great threat to whomever they run across. Dwarves that run afoul of the gods they worship may be cursed by the divine power of the spurned deities, turning them into werewolves or vampires. This is just a taste of the game's dozens of ongoing systems, any of which may affect your game in unexpected or even dramatic ways. Take the untimely death of Igish Saxulison, a minor drowned death while digging a tunnel for a tavern waterfall. After an unsuccessful attempt to recover the corpse, which resulted in two other dwarves drowning at the bottom of the tavern water, Waterfall. The decision had to be made to abandon the bodies, but as a result, a proper burial for the victims could never be held, and their spirits grew angry. Even though the waterfall that they died building was really cool and totally worth it, in their unjust desire for revenge, they would occasionally come back to the living world as ghosts and terrorize the dwarves who still lived there. A young dwarven child would one day have her leg permanently maimed by one of these ghosts leaving her unable to walk without a crutch. She now requires alcohol to even make it through the day, and suffers in a perpetual state of depression that she has never once managed to escape. And that's not even related to the ghost attack. She just got PTSD after being caught out in the rain once. Or look at the heroic last stand of Dobar Oslin Solos, who after a long day of carving this dude's face into the floor over and over again, tried to wind down with a nice beer in the tavern, when a rock, a horrific eagle of the size of a dragon, flew down the tavern waterfall and began to assault the fort from within. Panic ensued the bodies of dwarves began to pile as the rock tore through the crowd, but Dobar leapt into action and grappled the rock holding it down just long enough for the guard to respond in force. And although his actions saved the lives of many within the fort, he would himself succumb to his injuries and become a hero whose tale the faces would soon tell. Truly a noble death. Unlike his brother, who a week later got drunk and drowned in the tavern waterfall. Now, I should probably get rid of this thing. It is thanks to the heroics of dwarves like Dobar, though, that this particular fort withstood everything the game could throw at it. Fire-breathing snails, horrible rhino demons, or raging bands of cave worms were all repelled successfully. But after several dozen hours of playtime, the game began to slow to a crawl for some reason, as my computer struggled to maintain the simulation. After some poking around and online research, I quickly discovered it was because I had too many cats. All my cats were slowing down the game, and this guy on the internet said if I wanted to keep playing the game, I would have to kill all of my cats. And when someone tells you to kill 200 cats, you say, What the fuck? I'm not killing 200 cats, I love cats. Just look how cute they are. How could you hurt such a cute little face, and then 199 other identical ones? So I instead decided to abandon my fortress, to spare my cats, and totally not because a giant worm army I couldn't beat just happened to appear in the caverns below me. That had absolutely nothing to do with it. A silly little coincidence. Good luck with that though, Timmy. It is this final truth of Dwarf Fortress that makes it simultaneously so frustrating and yet replayable. Every fort is doomed to one day fall, whether it be to a powerful badger that came in and killed everyone, or a beautiful group of giant birds who one day came in and started killing everyone, or a giant worm army who I'm 
sure I would have been able to handle no problem. I, I was just bored guys, I, I promise. The fort was just too easy for me. And although losing a fort can be frustrating, it is the game's seemingly endless challenges that makes it exciting to jump right back into a new fort and test yourself against the wilds of this cruel world again and again, taking with you each time the lessons of the previously failed venture, all while the fascinating stories of the dwarves unfold before you each time, making each fortress a unique and memorable experience. You know something is going to go horribly wrong in the end, but the experience along the way is something truly unforgettable.